you know, not too long ago, I felt like entrepreneurship was kind of like a bad word. And, you know, it was the kind of the antithesis of design and realizing that, um, you know, you can be the greatest designer in the world, but if unless you have some business acumen, unless you be able to be able to get yourself out there and, and people are able to see your work, um, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to scale or, or succeed. I'm Karen Vaughn, Netflix host, YouTuber, and founder. In this series, I sit down with successful entrepreneurs. If you couldn't be the best, why not be the boss of the best? Inspiring creatives. The whole point of Jellybox was to support other small businesses. And heavy hitters. I said, I don't care what we eat. I just know that I'm mum green. Like I wanted people to understand and get to know Brunette as like what our values were. Who have changed the game in their industry. Sit back, relax, and enjoy these business stories because we're in good company. Okay, and we are back with part two of the conversation with lighting designer Matthew McCormick. If you have not watched part one, I would highly recommend jumping off this video and watching part one first because he has an amazing business story and in part one we cover how he really got off the ground and built this global lighting brand. So you don't want to miss that before you watch part two. But without further ado, this is just as good as part one, so let's get right into it. So because of all of this growth that you've experienced, you as a person, like the Matt McCormick, you, has there been something along the way that's helped you also level up personally while you're leveling up your business? I would say that there's two major contributing factors. Um, I've always been a big proponent of mentorship. And so I've had some incredible uh, mentors, uh, part of different organizations that help with that sort of stuff. Um, we were talking it, about EO earlier. Yes. That, you know, that it's, it allows you to stop learning from the heart, uh, school of hard knocks mm -hmm. and you stop making baby steps and you start making leaps mm -hmm. and because you can you can learn it your on your own but you're going to make mistakes but i'd rather take the fast track and so you know mentorship uh, having business coaches that was a, a really big one uh, but also having you know i you know not to get sentimental but having a good partner my wife has been there since day one and she's had my back and really has helped uh, well and she uh, works in the business she works in the business so she what's does. her role uh, she was business development, which kind of overarches um, marketing and sales. Uh, but now, uh, again, from her previous role working in, in marketing communications, at work, she's going to more focus on that and so help build out th that area, which I know she's really, really strong in, and we work very, very well together. And I, I got to admit, you know, I, I think anyone going into business with their, their partner or their significant other can come with its own anxiety and challenges. and challenges. And, you know, we were, you know, there was some worry about that to begin with, but to have something in common that you're both striving for and she's so good at what she does and offers so much support to not only myself, but the rest of the team, you know, having someone who's really got your back and is invested, not to say that everyone else isn't as invested, um, makes a huge, huge difference. And do you like go home at night and then talk about work or, or do you guys shut it off? Because I've always, like, I've always dreamed of working with a partner, um, but my husband, he's an airline pilot and has no interest in doing <laughs> anything remotely related to interior design. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I love the idea of working with your partner on like projects and doing things. But then I also think, you know, if you work so hard at it during the day, do you really want to go home and talk about it at night? I love the idea of working with your partner on like projects and doing things. But then I also think, you know, if you work so hard at it during the day, do you really want to go home and talk about it at night? Do you know what? Um, that's, it's not really a problem. Um, I, I, I can say that, like I said, when I first started off, you know, when I was mentioned before, when I was working from like six in the morning till midnight every single day, um, that was a little rough because I was fully in silo, I was fully doing my own thing. Yeah. Um, 
but not to say that she wasn't very, very supportive and I'd always get her feedback as well as coming from uh, a communications background. She, you know, she's good for, with, you know, crisis management. If anything came up, you know, we knew how to diffuse things, which was very, very, very helpful. Again, it's something we both get to share in. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, we do talk about it all the time. But where I was going with it is I remember even when I was working by myself, um, especially working from home, I didn't have any separation. Right. And so that was always was a big big problem that I had. I'm like, I can't turn it off. I can't sleep at night because the wheels are going. At a mentor at the time too, who told me, he's like, you figured out the secret. I'm like, oh yeah, what's that? He's like, you had a kid. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, interesting. Because it's true. Because then I, I not only did I have to get an office, but now there was a physical separation between work and home life. It's so funny that you're saying this because um, I haven't had kids yet, but I, I do want to have a family. And mm -hmm. I often think that like I bet if I had a kid, you it just forces you to shut off. You're it's not a, it's not even a choice. You're now focused on your kid. You're you're spending your Saturdays or your weekends or your evenings or whatever your time with your kid, and you're focused on them, and you're not thinking about work. It is true, and you know what? Um, I've maybe very organically or subconsciously um, have struck that balance where now when, you know, I leave it all on the field and I work my butt off all day long, but when I go home, it's home time and mm -hmm. it's with the kids, with my wife, and then, you know, you know, there might be some pillow talk about marketing strategies and stuff like that, <laughs> only because we both love it yeah. and it's, um, it doesn't feel like work. And I think that's the biggest thing too. And that's the only way you can put in those hours mm -hmm. The only way is that it doesn't feel like work. You know, that classic question, if, if uh, money were no object, what would you be doing? I'd be, I'd be doing the same thing. You'd be doing this. <laughs> yeah, or I'd be doing it more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. So I've got two questions and one is, so you've built this brand since and have been building it since 2013. Um, is there any distinct challenges, whether that came from like, I don't know, inventory or HR or just any growth challenges that you can kind of talk about that um, were big, big ones that you had to overcome? <sighs> Where, where do I begin? There's no, there's no shortage of challenges that you're going to find with scaling up from, you know, managing cash flow to, you know, mm -hmm. you know, people managing. Uh, that's why, you know, having people who, you know, hiring correctly, you know, you just eliminate a lot of the drama, uh, which is great. And so people come in and are just again with that extra value that they're bringing, it just makes everyone's life a whole lot easier. Yeah. yeah. Because well, managing people is so hard. It is hard. But then again, uh, having senior people that, you know, now I, you know, at one point I had a ton of direct reports. Now I've only got a couple because we've got a kind of a layer with the, the senior team, but we still, again, very transparent, quite literally, you know, people, yeah. <laughs> we're very transparent here and we, uh, there's a lot of glass. Yes. <laughs> But other things like even technical stuff, like especially moving from North America and getting certification for yeah. different parts of the world, you know, like the hoops you have to jump through for certification for UL, CE, C, CCC, uh, CSA, you know, there's all these hoops you have to jump through. Having inventory and how much inventory you should have mm -hmm. and, you know, how do you, you know, what is, what are your key differentiators and what's going to help you separate yourself from the rest of the pack? You know, is it lead time? Is it price? Is it this or that and you know setting up remote um, manufacturing or setting up remote uh, warehousing there's lots of moving around and you're not a, you're away from home that's a challenge that leaves a lot of onus on in my case on my wife um, and so it's yeah it's it's not without its challenges but again having the right people it just makes, makes it the, huge the biggest difference. biggest difference. Huge difference and you know having a good head on your shoulders too totally I think I've kind of settled into this and just have sort of accepted you know like in the beginning when it's like really you, like you are pushing that rock up the hill and you're kind of grinding it out and trying to get something off the ground there's almost a sense of like it's going to be easier it's going to be easier it's going to get easier but and it does get easier in a sense but if you're scaling and growing at the same time it's almost like as soon as you hit one marker you're just at another one with its own set of challenges and problems and I feel like that's a big part of what business is is that you're just continuously overcoming 
challenges to get to that like next rung on the ladder and then the next rung. Would you agree with that? I, I would 100% agree with that. And I, I again, with the, the scaling up, you know, there, there's certain levels you want to be able to do, you know, to be able to afford an office and be able to afford uh, research, research and development. And, mm -hmm. you know, it goes back to that, that first hire predicament. You know, do you make the money first to get the money or do you make the money to get the work? Yeah. And did we answer that? If you had to give advice on that, what would you say? Uh, <laughs> you know, get help, get help. If, if, if you can afford it, uh, get the help. Uh, for me, it's, you know, someone once told me, it's like, be as lean as humanly possible versus long as humanly possible. So, you know, it's, it's very easy to, you know, even seeing where, where we're at right now, it, you know, it's just a, you know, a blip in the, the lifespan of what we're going to be doing. There, there was one particular time I remember I had a friend over. Um, and I was on a phone call with a supplier for about 45 minutes, uh, just about discrepancy in my bill for like 75 bucks. It was nothing. And he's, yeah. <laughs> I get off the phone with him and he's like, that was the biggest waste of your time I've ever seen. I'm like, what? And he's like, you've just spent 45 minutes discrep you know, talking about a $75 charge. I'm like, you're hundred percent right. You kind of have to hear it in the right economy of words yeah. or these mental leaps. Like you have this aha moment. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I could absolutely, I could get someone to help me out with that. Yeah. And then, well, and that's what kind of what I was alluding to when I was saying like personally leveling up, right? If your time is worth more than $75 for that hour. Yeah, no, you should not be doing that anymore. Right. There's other things that you should be solving or other problems you should be tackling and, and someone else can do that for you. Yeah. And, and probably do a way better job than I would. Right. Yeah. And, oh, for sure. and, and then you could, and again, I think it's very important to understand and we do it with, even within our own team, understanding succession planning, like where do people want to go? What, where are their strong suits? Mm -hmm. uh, what do they want to develop more and, and then set them up for success, give them the tools, put, give them the schooling, give them everything they need to be able to succeed in that. You kind of enable people that way and they're a lot more engaged and they'll produce the, the best quality. Work. Yeah. Oh yeah. Way more. I mean, I love Love that you talk so um, highly of your team and it really sounds like you're so invested in your team too. Oh, and um, we were chatting earlier about the two hats, kind of like putting on your business hat and putting on your design hat. And let's talk about that a little bit because you've also mentioned that it's really important for you to have your fingerprint on your designs. And it's not an easy thing to do to constantly be switching from the business to the design. It's difficult to be shifting frequently in a day. Um, I haven't quite figured out the solution, but maybe, maybe you have an answer well, to that. I don't know if I haven't quite figured it out, but you know, I, I think, um, you know, historically I, I got into this business, uh, for the love of design and, and lighting. And I quickly found out that, I'm also in love with the business end of it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think, no. um, you know, I, you know, not too long ago, I felt like entrepreneurship was kind of like a bad word and, you know, it was the kind of the antithesis of design and realizing that, um, you know, you can be the greatest designer in the world, but if, unless you have some business acumen, unless you be able to be able to get yourself out there and, and people are able to see your work, um, unfortunately you're not going to be able to scale or, or succeed. Historically, I got into this business uh, for the love of design and lighting, and I quickly found out that I'm also in love with the business end of it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think, no. um, you know, I, you know, not too long ago, I felt like entrepreneurship was kind of like a bad word and, you know, it was the kind of the antithesis of design and realizing that, um, you know, you can be the greatest designer in the world, but if, unless you have some business acumen, unless you be able to be able to get yourself out there and, and people are able to see your work, um, unfortunately you're not going to be able to scale or, or succeed. It is a challenge, especially again, when you're growing and especially right now during uh, COVID, you know, that the business needs as many eyeballs and hands on deck as possible. And so, you know, the focus may, may shift a little bit. And so it might be hard to, you know, when I think of, uh, you know, you might be using different parts of your brain, you know, it's when the business is very analytical, very strategic, very, uh, very focused, where then to go then from that meeting to a design meeting where it's open and expansive so and opportunity and so creative it's hard to, it's hard to kind of get in that mode and even for myself it's hard to not to try to race to the end when we're ideating i'm like okay well how are we going to put that together how are we going to maintain it how are we going to get a package what the material process we're we going to have to do it's very right. easy to kind of get to the end yeah versus just like just being in that creative zone which is where the magic happens right that's right yeah 
And oftentimes, you know, the, the creativity doesn't necessarily, for me, doesn't always happen in an office and sure, surely doesn't happen in silo. Sure. I work the best when I'm working with others and collaborators, um, interior designers, architects, my staff. You've got many people kind of contributing yeah. and it makes for the best type of work. Wine helps too. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah, I know. I love that because um, I was going to your point there earlier about uh, entrepreneurship and almost being like um, the antithesis of a designer. And very, very early in my career, I um, had read out of this coaching pack that if you fill a room with designers, the best designer with the worst business skills will never have as much work as the worst designer with the best business skills. And that was a game changer for me early in my career. And that was really a big motivator to also building my team. And it made me realize how much, um, you know, to get out there and for people to see you and to get your next job, like just because you finish a job doesn't mean that there's a, another one on the heels of that one, right? Mm -hmm. Like you need to be seen, you need to be out there, you need to be doing business development. And um, that's a big portion of time, right? Like you can't just be sitting in a studio sketching or drawing or drafting all the time. And so um, that's where I really shifted my mentality and really started to focus a lot more on the business because I think for me, I knew that the creative, like if you're creative, which you are, that's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. That's only going to get better um, over time. Exactly. And especially with the more people and experiences and spaces and that you're exposed to, yeah. I think, I think is huge. I was going to say something as you were talking about, it. I was really want to listen to what you were saying. <laughs> uh, but there, there was a tip in there. It'll come to me. You are the face of your brand, but you're not, you're like your face isn't plastered everywhere. It really yeah. is about the product. Yeah. Just with, like, with the name on the door, you know, when we take a look at the trajectory of the company, um, you know, even when I first started off, there was a big question like, oh, should it be like, called something or it should be my name and you know I've, yeah. I had different people who talked about well you know if it's your name then you got to be forward facing and then you know if there was ever uh, a time where you were to you know when years and years years to come that uh, you ever were to sell it it might be a little bit more difficult and you know you know these are all the sort of things that we discussed um, I think maybe now that I've done it now you know it's you really own it you know there's no yeah. hiding at that point yeah. and i think one of the things that we were moving towards now is potentially you know even with this you know yeah. putting myself a little bit more forward yeah. and um understanding why people want to work with me or buy my product and much the same to you it is yeah. understanding that why you do it is one thing but why other people work with yes. you is very very uh, important to understand and especially when you've got your name on the door it's a very different reason why they're buying something from you totally totally and you this is I mean I have this has been going round and round in my mind for the last couple of years is you know as you scale and get bigger and other opportunities come up like they have in my world, I'm always thinking about, okay, how can I empower my team? How can I step away more and more? And out of necessity of also wanting to take on other projects. Mm -hmm. But it's challenging when clients are coming because they want you. And sometimes I wonder, is that because my name is on the door or is it because, you know, I am the designer that's built this brand and has, and have had my fingerprint on all these projects and that's why a client is coming because they want that fingerprint you know it's regardless of whether or not your name is on the door do you true. know what i mean no i know exactly what you mean there's a very big difference between dealing with apple and dealing with the late steve jobs right yes. you know it's you if you're working with apple you're still getting a piece of him but maybe you know that's where there's also an opportunity there. And you know what I'm thinking about as you're saying this is because you talked a lot about um, vision earlier on and it really yeah. having a vision for the project, listening to the client, being able to tell that story and that being a unique skill set that you have, which I'm sure that you have that and you do better than anyone else in your company. Like I'm sure of that, right? There's no yeah. way that you can. And I know that I do that in my company and I don't know if it's something that I can train, but I, I'm just like a little light bulb is going on for me right now as we're having this discussion that I think that that is a big part of it with design is that when you have a vision and you're able to create this vision based on all of these different factors, what your client wants, what your collaborators want or need, what the space like calls for, 
um, that is what is so special about what you're delivering. Mm -hmm. and, and to that point, we go even just bring it back to people in these strategy meetings. In these strategy meetings, like we, we had one as early as this morning where we actually had the whole team and, and we were kind of doing a full SWOT analysis of uh, what the company is about. And I think it's important to have everyone involved so everyone knows because then people, not only they engage, but they have the shared vision. Mm -hmm. They know exactly, they're hearing it direct, they're inputting into it. And no matter who you're talking to in the business, you're getting a little piece of that. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to talk to me. You know, you, you yeah. could very easily talk to any number of the people on the team yeah. and you'll get the same thing. Yeah. So cool. It is. Well, you, you've done such an amazing job and I feel like this is a great, great time to do our not so rapid, rapid fire. Let's do it. So this was an idea that was banging around for a while. And so they really let me run with it. But I don't know if it was subconscious or not, but it was right around the time my wife was pregnant with our first child. And so when we launched it and it coincided with the birth of my first child, I felt like it was, I'd be remiss not to call it after her. So that, we called it Mila, because it reminded me of the way my wife held her stomach. I love that so much. You ready? Let's do it. Okay. What do you want to be remembered for? Oh my goodness. Um, Coming out with a bang. <laughs> for being a nice human being that happens to do design. Ah, oh, which is who you are. Which is really who you are. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I know, for sure. I love that. What would you tell your 19 year old self if you had to give your 19 year old self advice? Um, enjoy it while you can. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, I, you know, what, there's Have no, fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> there is nothing I would change. Like, I, I, I got, I'm, and that it goes back to the regret thing. Like, um, I, although I didn't use those words, it, it's it's not playing small. Like, I've always yeah. done what I've wanted to do um, and really gone for it. If it was, you know, my whole family. I've got a huge family in Ontario. We've got 11 grandkids. Um, I'm one of five. So there's a lot to miss. Um, but you know, and I'm the only one who moved away. They all live five minutes away from each other. Um, but you know, always kind of forging my own path and doing what I wanted to do. And I, and I feel that that's been kind of the, the secret sauce that's afforded me to do what I get to do now. Because if I had to work a nine to five again, at some point there is some complacency that happens, which is the death cry for anyone who is creative. Yeah. And so I think I, I stumbled into something out of love but i realized that you know being an entrepreneur that is in business of design mm -hmm. was my path and i found mm -hmm. it and now now totally. i'm just full speed yeah i love it and that is such great advice do not play small yeah do not play small mm -hmm. can we just touch on that just really quick because i do I, I love that you were just flexing a little bit and doing it so naturally and candidly and it's not really flexing it's just genuinely talking about what is going on today in your business, which is so cool because you're in all of these amazing places. And can you just, just recap that for me, please? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things with, with the, the scaling, the difficulty too is, you know, that we talked a lot about like cash flow management and what have you and, and setting up shop and where do you, where do you invest in first? You know, we very intentionally invested in our systems, in our people and, in order to be able to grow. And, you know, that was, you know, that goes right back to that original question. Do you hire the right people first or do you get the money to do it first? And so, um, by growing slowly and being as lean as possible, I've been able to take everything and just put it back in the company, then back in the company. Company and back to the company and um, especially when it comes to when I'm looking at, when I talk to and listen to a lot of my interior designers and architects and other people that we get to work with even beyond price or discount it's the lead time component of it and so moving from historically where we were just in time manufacturing to to an inventory state mm -hmm. you know it's you don't want to you know a lot of times you'll invest in all this inventory to satiate this lead time um opportunity that people really really want because interior designers are notorious to leave things the last minute 
Hey no, now. Not Karen. Not Karen. Hey now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it happens, you know, and you know, and you want to be able to jump on the opportunity. And oftentimes, you know, they, they may be calling for a certain brand of lighting, but it has a 12 week lead time. Oh, totally. There's a really big project that we're working on right now. It's a 10,000 square foot house in Caledon. Beautiful house. The architect is amazing. I feel very, very lucky to be working on this project, but they have a quick turnaround time because we were brought in, um, I mean, they were already boarding when we were brought in. And so oh, wow. we were like finishing lighting, all that stuff. And so some of the stuff that we've pulled or specced, it's like, if you have a 12 week lead time, we, it just can't get in there. It doesn't matter how beautiful it is. And it's not like the clients can't afford it. They're willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But, um, if the lead time doesn't work, then we just can't get it into the project. Absolutely. And that's where understanding if that is a, a, a true opportunity, then, you know, getting yourself into an inventory state will be really important. But even if you have inventory, how do you manage that inventory? So there's been a lot of time invested in having an ERP system that fully integrates with our accounting and our software and manages all of our, every single nut and bolt in the company from around the world will know exactly where it is. Um, and so then you have this solid foundation in which to build upon. And that's why I reference like, you know, if you pour gas on a fire that you can't get your hands around, it quickly gets your own success could be your own for failure. Oh, because totally. You take out your own brand, yep. right? And your own you're reputation. Not you're not fulfilling. You're not getting yeah. stuff done on time. There's been a real true focus on that area. And so now the fun part is now that, you know, just even during COVID time, it's really allowed us to really focus and put a lot of time and effort to that. Now it's like full bowl. Now let's put gas on the fire. So that's yeah. the part that I'm really excited about. Oh, that is very cool. It's like a real, that's very cool. I love how that analogy. And it's, as you were talking, I was just thinking like, whew, come a long way from the guy that like cut up some brass parts <laughs> and wired in a little chandelier. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, and that's, you know, there's, there's a certain sense of uh, obviously pride and ac uh, accountability and ownership that you have when you do that. And it's, it's funny. I had this guy, this is kind of anecdotal. Um, I used to go uh, to this convenience store by my house all the time, and there was this guy, Mohammed was his name, Momart was his name <laughs> of the store. And I'd always talk to him about my business and stuff like that. And um, he made a comment, and it's something that resonates with me to this day. He's like, You're getting your master's degree, and one way or another, you're paying for it. And so, you know, you know, if it's um, lumps and bumps you yeah, learn along the way or challenges, you know, you're, it's just preparing you and you're becoming stronger, more, you know, more experienced. And that's something you take with you. And so now times when things come up, you know, there's always something that's going to come up. And I think that's also um, very imperative for myself and my company where we're very customer uh, service focused. When something comes up, you have the experience to know that how to, to deal with it and deal with it appropriately mm -hmm. and not get to overly bent out of shape about it yeah yeah it's all the learning along the way totally because people you know what i say to my team all the time you know when people buy something from you they're they're buying an expectation you're going to deliver on what it uh what it is that they paid for what they're not paying for is when you have challenges and there's always going to be challenges and that's where sometimes having a challenge can turn into an opportunity and a win for you because they're not expecting that. And so sometimes, you know, if you were to bury your head in the sand and not deal with it, can blow up in your face. Whereas a lot of times if you go head on with it, let the customer know, hey, there's been a delay or this or that, sometimes it's not a problem. And sometimes like, hey, wow, this guy really went above and beyond and made sure and over communicated and yeah. over delivered in some this cases. This is what I've been saying to my team uh, a lot lately is like, if there is a challenge that comes up or a mistake happens, that is an opportunity for you to actually shine and for us it's, to shine. It, it doesn't it's, sound it's, it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive, but it's like something happens on a you're staying in a hotel room, you have a bad experience, you go down to the concierge and you're like, you know what, this and they go, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Matthew McCormick, you know you know what? Let's we're gonna we're gonna put you in the pento suite and um, why don't you go sit at the bar, drinks are on us, and you're like, Oh my god, this is great, right? The bellboy takes you up to your, the penthouse and you've got champagne and strawberries waiting and you're like, This is the best hotel ever, and you're never gonna go anywhere else. So I do feel like sometimes those challenges and failures is an opportunity for you to actually reinforce 
um, your brand and the customer service side of things. And, and that's where the, 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 your values come back into play. And I know that's one that we high, hold very, very high is our customer service and customer care. And so it's at the level that we're talking about, you know, quality is not a key differentiator. Um, you know, design could be, you know, I think people much like art, it's, it's subjective, um, you know, what you like or don't like. Um, but that customer service, you know, it's, you know, a price, it's, it's the stuff is it's gonna be cheap. It's, it's gonna be the highest quality, but that, customer care and aftercare is just as important. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. Mm -hmm. So cool. So cool. Okay. More rapid so fire. many great takeaways. Yes. Back on to the not so rapid rapid fire. Um, and the advice that you had where we just ended is don't play small. Don't play small. Yes. Which I think is amazing advice. I love that so much because it's easy to slip into that, right? Like well, you were just talking yeah. about all these amazing experiences that you're having and you're sitting at the table with like Tom Dixon's across the table and going, how did I get here, right? But why not it be you? You know, you've worked mm -hmm. hard and you've created these opportunities and um, yeah, there's no reason to play small. And I think you actually do the people around you a disservice too when you play small. That's right. And, you know, it's, I think sometimes it's, you want to lead by example and, you know, not that I'm, um, I try to be preachy or overbearing and that's not my leadership style. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's, you know, I'm going to be the first one in last one out and, mm -hmm. and sometimes leading by example and putting the time in, um, gets a much more engaged team. Yeah. Yeah. What is your guilty pleasure? <laughs> Oh, what is my guilty pleasure? I'm gonna have to think about that one for a oh, second. Oh, come on, this gotta be good. A uh, guilty pleasure. I'm I'm obsessed with cookies. I love cookies. Um, nom, 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 oh, nom, 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 nom. I don't know if, you, if we're talking about like a show or anything no, like that. No, any, whatever. Uh, you know, it's um, yeah. If, if I have a guilty pleasure, it's, especially people in the office know that if they want, if they if they gotta win me over or something's gonna be late, they slip a cookie across the yeah. table. I'm like. You know me. <laughs> I'm a cookie fan. You're like, what do you want? <laughs> um, are you a morning or a night person? Um, I'm both, weirdly. I, I tend to be pretty high energy um, okay. uh, most of the time. One thing that uh, not a lot of people know about me is I've never had a coffee in my life. I, I, don't, I just don't drink coffee. Oh my all. God, we can't be friends anymore. Do, do you know what's even <laughs> equally as weird? I've never had a beer in my life. Stop. Uh, I, I'm not a weirdo. Like I'll drink hard bar all no, day I long. I think you like, kind of are. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just not a beer drinker. But anyhow, um, you Usually a pretty high functioning. You know, I'm, I'm used to getting up at the crack of dawn, obviously with kids, or yeah. if I want to go snowboarding or something like that, I'm going somewhere. So I like that, but I'm also a little bit of a night owl because it's especially now with a family, and um, you know, you don't have your own time very often. You know, sure. you're, you're rushing all day with the kids, and then uh, or sorry, with work, and then you come home, you spend as much time as you can with the kids. Kids go down, spend a little bit of time with your wife, then your wife goes down. And you're like, okay, it's 10 o'clock, and I got my time, and yeah. and so I often sometimes staying up a little bit too late. Because yeah. I'm, you know, want to yes. catch up on a little bit of work. Very rarely is it work, but you know, just design. Like just downtime. I mean, yeah. Downtime, but I'm, that's where I'm also getting inspired. Where totally, you know, we talk about taking the hat off. I've taken off the work hat. I've taken off the dad hat. I've taken off the spouse hat, and now it's my time. And that's oftentimes where I find I'm the most inspired. Is that yeah. Literally. So I often sometimes staying up a little bit too late because yeah. I'm, you know, want to yes. catch up on a little bit of work. Very rarely is it work, but you know, just design like just downtime. I mean, downtime, but I'm, that's where I'm also getting inspired. Where totally, you know, we talk about taking the hat off. I've taken off the work hat. I've taken off the dad hat. I've taken off the spouse hat, and now it's my time. And that's oftentimes where I find I'm the most inspired. Is that yeah. late at night? That's cool. That's cool. So how late do you, would you go to bed? Do you think? I'm usually a midnight. 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 And how, how early do you wake up? Quarter to six. Yeah. Okay. It's it's not awesome, but you know, um, you know, when you've got young kids, that that you know, it's <laughs> that's broken sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. See, this is why it's the not so rapid rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> what does a typical day look like for you? Um, well, it, it all depends on what day of the week it is. Um, I know Do you break out your schedule like that? Like different days, different like strategy on Mondays oh, kind of thing? Yeah, we, I've, I've got a very regimented uh, work week where there's, uh, you know, very, we, I've got schedule one-on-ones with all my senior team. Uh, we also have scheduled um, marketing meetings once a week, strategy meetings once a week. Um, 
and so that's very very important but you know the day can differ from getting up um, you know again if I'm working from home it's play a little play a little with the kids until our morning huddle then it's jump into work and I'm fully focused until 5 36 o'clock yeah. um, or if I'm coming into the office um, you know I get to deke a little bit of the the parental uh, duties because I got to leave pretty early so you know get my daughter at least sorted um, and so I can if I have to take her to daycare or not, mm -hmm. and then it's in office and it's just full on, like yeah. leaving it out on the floor all day yeah. long. A little bit yeah. of firefighting, a little bit of um, proactive work, a little bit of design. And are you pretty like scheduled, like 9 a.m. this, 10 a.m. this, 11 a.m. this? Yes. Yeah, me too. But then, you know, that's also the- And do you love it or do you hate it? I love it because it's scheduled, but then there's, and, you know, it's never what you think you're going to be doing the day. I ha may have it all scheduled, and all of a sudden, one one meeting moves or has to get pushed, and one meeting gets. And it's so being adaptable, and I kind of love the fact that it's always different. It's scheduled, and I have things I got to do, but the space in betweens are always have to be a little bit fluid. What's the first thing you do when you get an idea? I sketch it out. You do? Yeah, yeah. It's, I can, I'm. I'm very much, you know, I think people draw inspiration from many different things. For me, the, um, oftentimes it has nothing to do with lighting. It could be from sculpture, it can be from jewelry, mm -hmm. or even from music. You know, yeah. like I find like just put on music. Um, oh yeah, inspiration comes from anywhere. Yeah. I think, you know, most people, I think Pharrell says this, where he suffers from uh, synesthesia, where you, your senses get mixed, like you hear something, but you, then you see something. Yes. And, I, and that's- I've never heard that before, but that's really cool. I liken it to, I don't think it's the exact same thing, but you know, when you smell something and it instantly teleports you somewhere else, yeah. it's, it's similar in that vein, but you know, if I hear a certain, music i instantly get visuals of exactly what it would look like um if i were to do like say a music video or uh, can inspire different things um and so yeah if i'm inspired by something it's i have to you sketch uh, it out i sketch it out so do you carry like a little sketchbook or a notebook with you um or? i do or you know i've got my ipad with yeah. me and uh but you know like the, the amount of sketches that have just you know all I've been on the back of napkins and, totally. you know, and I think it, it stems from me just being a kid, uh, you know, this is again more anecdotal that, you know, I remember being a kid and going out for dinner with my parents and, you know, it was being, having so many kids in yeah. the family, it was like, mom, can I have a pen? Can I have a pen? Yeah. Because we would take our placemats and flip it over and then we could draw. Oh, that's fun. And so as a kid, I would always walk around and I've mentioned this in a few keynotes before, I, I used to be made fun of it. I'd walk around with this briefcase and my briefcase would anytime I'd get inspired by something like a cartoon or comic, I would cut it out yeah. and put it in my inspiration briefcase. And so I'd carry it whatever oh I Oh my God, an inspiration briefcase. And I have it to this day. And if you go on my desktop, I have now it's, it's digital, but like if I'm inspired by something into the suitcase, it goes. So fun. You know, that's what Pinterest is all about. Maybe I was just a little bit ahead of my time, yeah. but you know, it was a place that I could put stuff. So if I had to generate ideas, I've been collecting this whole time and I could pull. From I them. love that. I love that so much because when I was five I always imagined myself going to work um, carrying a briefcase I didn't know what I was gonna do but I knew it was gonna be creative and um, so now I'm kind of thinking maybe it was my own inspiration briefcase there you go <laughs> do you have any favorite books probably the, the most formidable one there was kind of two by uh, this uh, there was a time in my life where I was very heavy into my yoga practice um, going six times a day twice on Saturdays I was part of a mentorship group I was doing it quite a bit and uh, with that there was a lot of different reading I was doing and there's this uh, Buddhist female monk um, uh, Perma children I'm sure I'm saying her name wrong um, but there's two books actually uh, places that scare you and when things fall apart oh. um, and so it was it's was very interesting you know again it, it's um, it's a different approach maybe almost a mindset and realizing that might be in the turbulence of these rapids and all you want is the stability of the shores but if you realize if you stay put in where you are right now the chaos will flow around you and you are the, the constant and, mm -hmm. and I think that sometimes for me it's these mental hurdles that we've talked about beforehand and I think having these kind of mindsets where there's now there's nothing that you can't throw at me that I can't figure out and if there's one thing I know about myself 
I'll, I'll figure it out. And no matter what it is, I will, hell or high water, I'll figure it out. I'm going to need to get these books from you. When things fall apart. When things fall apart. And places that scare you. Places that scare you. Both written by her. And they're, they're great for all aspects of your life. If things are going good or if you've just suffered a b bad breakup, you know, like it's, it's great. It, it kind of frames things really, really nicely. When you were talking there, it made me think that um, it's sort of the sense of being really grounded. Right? Yes. Like really grounded and really still because I think, um, especially when you own a business and are running a business and you're scaling, it can be chaos, right? And then on top of that, if you throw in stuff that's going on with your family or your relationship or just like a bad day, it can really, if you're not really just grounded in um, who you are and where you're going, um, it can really throw you, right? You can be really reactive to all of this external stuff that's happening or a client is unhappy, mm -hmm. issues with staff, whatever. Um, and I think you really need kind of like that mental and strength and, it, and perspective. And it's perspective. 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 Yeah. I, like I mentioned before, you know, like even here where we are right now in our, in our various careers, understand that this is just a blip in the long, long scale of things. And if you were to kind of take that 3000 foot look at everything, it looks a lot different than this is the micro problem that I'm dealing with right now. And I, I tend to try to pull out. And I think that's also if mm -hmm. most visionaries kind of think that way, not, mm -hmm. not fucking them a visionary, but people who have a little bit of a vision kind of see things that way. They don't drill down into the minutia. Yeah. And so, you know, if there's, that's also why I don't find myself ever getting stressed. You know, it's just, really? this is, yeah, it's, really? I, I'm not, and I, <laughs> I, I, I know it's, it's, it's such a harsh claim, but you know, I, I think, you know, if you've ever worked with me or, or uh, even the people I, I work around and get to work with that, you know, it's, it's that perspective things, you know, like, we're not and dealing it's with, gonna work out it's gonna work out this isn't life and death you know yeah. there's gonna be people who are gonna be upset and the, but there's ways to you know if, if something is late um, well you know we're gonna figure this out we're gonna do we're gonna go above and beyond mm -hmm. and um, and so I always know that at the end of the day we are leaving like I keep on saying we're leaving all in the field there's nothing I could possibly do better or more mm -hmm. and so I can't stress about it because I'm not sleeping on anything. Mm -hmm. With leaving it on the field too, I also think about that in the context of I'm just leaving it at work, right? If it has to be dealt with yeah. today or with a client or with staff or if something needs to be said, I'm just going to say it now and leave it on the field because I don't want to be taking this home with me. Like I don't want to be taking this home and ruminating, ruminating about it, can't sleep, whatever, whatever. You just deal with it in the moment and leave it all there. <laughs> I sleep like a log. <laughs> <laughs> Now, like, it's the no coffee. Yeah, that, that's probably it too. <laughs> okay, so you talked a little bit about who your biggest role model is. Ingo Maurer would definitely be up there. Just, you know, the, you know, unfortunately he's passed since, but, you know, I was always so intrigued by, you know, the intrinsic value that he created with kind of very oh, house found objects or, you know, how he understood perspective and light and shadow where there's times where you come up to it and you're like, what am I really looking at? And, you know, it's almost these weird optic illusions sometimes he creates. Yeah. I just keep on using the word magic. I don't know how else to describe yeah. it. It's, yeah. it's this wonder where you have that, that quarter head turn. That's the magic right there where yeah. you don't quite get what you're looking at right away. So cool. Two last questions, okay? Go for it. What did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to, oh. I'll distinctly remember when I was in grade eight, you know, growing up, they always, you had speeches was part of your curriculum. And I remember in grade eight, uh, they did it a little bit differently. Instead of preparing like a five minute speech, it was just, it was more, I wouldn't say improv, but impromptu, like you're given a something to talk about and I I distinctly remember I was the very first one I got the I drew the first thing it's like what do you want to be when you grow up I'm like I want to be an artist um and I wanted because this is even before computers or the internet not that I'm dating myself um but I'm like I want to be an artist I want to move to BC and I want to paint and I, I that's what I want to do when I grow up oh my and when, gosh, I'm, so when I'm 27 cool. I would get married and then I have two kids <laughs> and all that sort of stuff do you consider yourself an artist you know, there's so much pretension with that's such a loaded word. And it's, I even see, see the thing, same thing with designer. I, I, I liken myself more to being a creative, you know, yeah. it's, um, you know, it, it may look like an oil painting one day, it might look like an, a light the other day, or it might look like a, a video mm -hmm. another day. And I, I don't try to paint myself too much in a box and just being more of a creative, I think it gives me that creative freedom to flex where, where, you need to. To where I need to. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Last question. Do you have any favorite quotes? 
I've, I've got so many, and I'm just I'm, now I'm blank because I want to pick a good one. Don't play small. I think that's kind of been the, uh, we've echoed that a or few Or like times. best piece of advice, and I, and I think that the don't play small, I, I can't even tell you how much I love that so much because there have been times when I've, through my own mentors or coaching, that topic has come up. It's like, Karen, why, why are you playing small? right now why are you playing small right like you you can play big and by playing big you allow other people around you to do that as well and it's also more authentic right like when you're shrinking yeah. you are now not being your true authentic self mm -hmm taking on the type of work that you want to be doing mm -hmm. you know you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, you know a little bit of scarcity where like you know the next job is not always guaranteed and you don't have the next one lined up um, and, you know in growing slowly there may be some projects that maybe you keep back a house to kind of keep the, the lights on um, but really making sure that you're presenting the type of work that you want to be doing uh, you know I had a, a colleague once say to me that uh, you know you start designing banks you'll be doing banks for the rest of your life and so really making sure that you're doing the type of work that you want to be doing because it attracts the type of work you yes. want to be doing and because there's sometimes there's nothing better than saying no to certain things and it's 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 yeah. it's empowering and it affords you to do the type of work that you want to be doing that you want to be known for doing and do more of yeah and and then you start to really flourish and and that's all about building a brand too so that kind of connects to you and building a brand and i'm a uh, like an absolute believer in this is that, um, you know, even if when you're building your business and, and I just talked about this on a podcast, like if you have one project that you absolutely love and you've got three that, you know, you don't want to showcase, don't showcase them because you want to be putting out, um, and taking on work that supports your brand, helps you build your brand, reinforces your brand, um, attracts other people to your brand. And you need to be very consistent in what that is. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And it's, it's, it's tough when you're first starting out and you're like, but it's not so bad when you're, you know, you're running out of your own, your own home or anything like that. But that's where being lean as humanly possible. I've just seen so many companies come and go where they're like, I'm going to start a company. I'm going to drop a hundred grand on, you know, on an office outfit, or I'm going to just jump into product development and spend a quarter million dollars on prototypes. Well, have you got a, do you have a proof of concept yet? Totally. And start small. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, but think big, you know, you, I know yeah. we're, a little bit counterintuitive between um, not thinking small, but you know you can you can still have large aspirations while being lean. Well, we've just been talking about this about having starting in small places, like having small offices, you know, like growing slowly. You were working on your own for four years before hiring a full time person, um, and th that those types of sacrifices. And I don't even know if you call them sacrifices. It's more like working smart, right? Yes. And but it's those moves that afford you the bigger moves and enable you to scale up. Absolutely. And that's one thing too, like we, we talked about off camera too. I, I, I also just feel like we're just getting started. Like there's, yeah. there's so many things that we put yeah. into motion about a year ago and they're just getting implemented now. That's really going to help us really take it to the next level. Yeah. And so that's what I'm, I'm really most looking forward to in the coming years for sure. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much. Matthew McCormick, the Matthew McCormick, the man behind the brand. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm so excited to connect with you more. Absolutely. We will. Yeah. We're neighbors. We're neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, everyone. That is it for this episode with Matthew McCormick. I would love to know, we would love to know what your favorite takeaway was from this episode. I know that he had so much great information about building his business that it will be hard to choose, but definitely comment down below and let us know what your favorite takeaway is. I'm so pleased that we got to have this conversation. He really is an inspiration to me and I just respect this business that he's built so much. So thank you to all of you for watching In Good Company. There's lots more great episodes to come. I can't wait for you to see another one and another guest. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss out on when the next episode goes live. Of course, hit that like button and we'll see you in the next episode.